Hello everyone, my name is Amay Bhangale and in this talk, I'll be talking about approximability of satisfiable CSPs 3. Um, so I'll talk about random restrictions on Boolean functions, uh, linearity test and direct product testing. And this is joint work with Subhash Koth and Tor Minzer. So a Boolean function is a function that maps uh, 0, 1 to the end to 0, 1. And we have this Fourier decomposition of a function where we have a coordinate Fourier uh, coefficient for every subset of n. And a Fourier decomposition of a function is unique. And these chi ss, these are called characters, which are just minus one to the parity of the xi's, uh, where you just sum the xi's from the set s. So, and a function is f is called a linear function if f of x is one minus the character over two or some subset s. And in general, f is correlated to a linear function if one of the Fourier coefficients is heavy. Uh, in, and for our uh, work, heavy just means that uh, one of the Fourier coefficients is constant, which is independent of n, is at least a constant, which is independent of n. So suppose mu is a distribution on the bits 0, 1, where it has some uniform component and uh, uh, the other component is non-uniform or the bits 0, 1. So u is a uniform distribution on the bits 0 and 1 and alpha is some constant less than 1. So let me define uh, the kind of random restriction. So random restriction, it takes the subset i of n and then it takes a string z from 0, 1 to the i. So first select a subset i by including every coordinate j in i with priority 1 minus alpha independently. Then we select a string z from 0, 1 to the size of i according to the distribution nu, which is the second component of this distribution mu. And the restricted function based on the restriction i z is a function from 0, 1 to the n minus i to 0, 1, where if you take the input x, it just you just plug the input x on the remaining coordinate and plug z uh, at the coordinate uh, i. So one good thing about uh, random restriction is that it lets you move from an arbitrary distribution to just the uniform distribution. Because now in this, uh, uh, in this restricted function, x, you can plug a uniform distribution for this x, as we already sampled z according to the distribution nu. And the question we want to understand is that if the restricted function satisfies a certain property, then what can we deduce about the original function? And the property uh, that we want uh, to understand is what if after restriction, the function satisfies certain linear uh, property. So more formally, if you, uh, the priority over the random restriction i and z, the restricted function is correlated to a linear function is at least some constant eta. Okay. So suppose we are given this f where uh, for this f, the restricted uh, for the restrict for a typical restriction, the restricted function becomes correlated to a linear function. Then, in this case, we want to understand uh, what can we deduce, uh, deduce about the original function f. So, let's look at a few examples. So, when f is a low degree function, then one can show that if you do a random restriction, then in fact f becomes a constant function, and a constant function is a linear function. So. Uh, certainly, if the original function is low degree, then it has this property. Another uh, example is if the original function is a linear function, then after you restrict a few coordinates of linear function, it still remains linear in the rest of the coordinates. And the, our main theorem shows that these are really the two possibilities. So in other words, if we have a function f such that after random restriction, it correlates with uh, a linear function with non-negligible probability, then we can show that uh, f is correlated to a low degree function and a product of a low degree function and a, a linear function. Okay, And in fact, we can take the low degree function to be just f multiplied by the same linear function i s and take the low degree component of this function. So in the rest of the talk, I will uh, discuss one application of the main theorem. And if I have time, I'll discuss just uh, uh, techniques that go into proving the uh, main random restriction theorem that I just mentioned earlier. So we, apply, uh, so we give an application of our main theorem to this property of linearity testing. 
So what is this question? So we are given a query access to f, a Boolean function, uh, and we want to decide if f is a linear function or f is far from every linear function. And we have a very natural test, which is called the BLR linearity test. You sample x and y uniformly from 0, 1 to the n. Then you set z to be x plus y, coordinate where uh, you do coordinate with addition of x and y to get the z. And then you check if f of x plus f of y is equal to f of z. Now it's easy to see that if f is indeed a linear function, then it satisfies the test with priority one. And uh, another uh, easy example to uh, keep in mind is that a random function, which has no linear structure, it also passes the test with priority half. Um, and we can uh, understand the test in two uh, regime of parameters. One is the 99% regime, which is an easier problem. Here, we want to understand if the test passes with priority almost one, say 99%, can we deduce that f is correlated to a linear function? And this was uh, answered by Bloom, uh, Luby, and Rubinfield in 90s, where they show that if the test passes with uh, one minus epsilon probability, then f is indeed correlated to a linear function. And then there is another regime, which is the 1% regime, which is 1% is basically 1% better than the random function. Here, the question is, if the test passes with probability half plus epsilon, then can we deduce that f is correlated to a linear function? So again, this problem is harder than the 99% regime problem because we only have the guarantee that the test passes with slightly better than the 50% that, uh, that is true for random function. And this, again, is answered positively by Pellare, Copper, Smith, Pastat, Kiwi, and Sudan in 96. And so what we are interested in is in biased linearity testing where we want each query to, distribute, uh, to be distributed uniformly uh, uh, to be distributed according to the p-biased measure on, on the bit 0, 1, which is you just sample 1 with priority p and you sample 0 with prior, probability 1 minus v for a fixed p, constant p. So p-biased distributions, these are uh, in, really important in theoretical computer science. And just to give a couple of examples, so they are used to understand the sharp threshold behavior of different graph properties. They are also used in many uh, hardness approximation results. So understanding the test or just understanding p-biased distribution, uh, properties of a function under a p-biased distribution, uh, this is uh, really important. So just a bit of a history about uh, linearity testing uh, where each query is distributed according to p-biased. So Coperty and Saraf, they gave constant query test in the 99% regime. Then David, Dinur, Goldenberg, Kindler, uh, and Schinker, they gave a linearity testing over a slice, which you can also think of a slice as some, uh, it's not exactly a p-biased measure, but it's like similar to a p-biased measure where uh, each query, it has a fixed number of ones in it. So they also gave a linearity test on a slice, but in the 99% regime. Then recently, Dinur, Filmus, and Harsha, they gave a four query a linearity test uh, p-biased under the 99% regime. In fact, their result is more general. They give, they give a test, which is two to the d plus one query, which has, which qu whose query complexity is two to the d plus one. And it is a test for degree d functions. And if you apply that result to linear functions, then you get a four query test, the, the uh, p-biased distribution. And the main result that we show, so as you see, uh, all the previous results, they are in the 99% regime. And uh, the main result that we show is that uh, we uh, we have a linearity test uh, for uh, where each query is distributed according to a p biased measure for p in between one third and two third, and uh, it has completeness one and soundness half plus epsilon. So this is really the linearity testing in the one percent regime, which is a harder problem. So uh, in the next uh, section of this talk. I uh, I want to connect the random restriction theorem that I mentioned earlier with this biased linearity testing. And the proof overview is like high, very high level. So let mu to the n be a distribution of the four queries where you know the fourth query is the addition of the first three queries. So mu is really a distribution on four bits. So you tensor it n times, that gives you uh, four queries, x, y, z, and w. And for technicalities, we also need the distribution nu to be pairwise independent. 
And because of this reason, uh, our test only works for P, which is in one third and two third. So let's say uh, you have such a distribution on the four queries, it's a tensor distribution. And suppose P satisfy the linearity test with priority half plus epsilon. Now, uh, here I, I change the uh, output from zero one to minus one plus one uh, be, uh, so that I can do, uh, it's, it's easier to do the analysis in this uh, in this world where, uh, where you change from Boolean inputs to plus one minus one. But so we so if the, if this function f passes the linearity test uh, with probably half plus epsilon, one can easily conclude from this that this expectation is large, where you just take uh, the queries uh, according to this description and multiply f at those values. Now let's apply random restriction uh, so that we move to a uniform distribution. So you you pick uh, the parameter alpha uh, uh, so that once you do the random restriction, the rest of the coordinates, you can put a uniform distribution so that uh, each query distribution is identical to the original distribution. So you just, you, we are just removing the non-uniform component from the distribution uh, mu. So now you can think of X, Y, Z, W, they are distributed uniformly. And this is a standard linearity test question. And uh, this we know how to analyze easily using standard Fourier analysis. And from this, we can conclude that these restricted functions, they are correlated to linear functions. So this is easy. So uh, again, so the point was we started with the linearity test and we concluded that the restricted functions, uh, they are correlated to linear functions. And this is where we can use our restricted random restriction theorem. So when we apply random restriction theorem to these functions, we get that the original f indeed, I mean, indeed the original f is also uh, uh, correlated to a linear a product of linear function and low degree functions. So now uh, another important thing that our restricted uh, random restriction theorem uh, gives is that the low degree function is really the function f, the multiplication of f and the character and the low degree part of f, the low degree part of this function. So if the uh, expected value of gi is large, it just tells us that f is correlated to chi si. So let's assume for contradiction that the, uh, each GI is balanced because otherwise we would be done F is correlated to a character. And we can also show that all these SIs, they are uh, sort of identical to each other for this expectation to be large. Because if they're not, then uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, variance and that uh, that is enough to kill the whole uh, expectation. Okay, so uh, so I mean these are more or less technical issues, but if we if we handle these uh, technical technicalities, then in the end we are left with such an expression. These are just the low degree part of the uh, function that we got out of the uh, restriction uh, random restriction theorem, and we get that this whole expectation is large. Now this is where we apply the Moser's invariance uh, principle. Uh, which basically tells us that uh, expected value of product is equal to the product of expectations if the distribution nu satisfies a certain property. Um, so we can apply this theorem and get that this expectation is equal to the expected value, uh, the product of the expectations. And since we assume that each GI is balanced, we get that this whole expression is close to zero. And then this leads to a contradiction because uh, we assume that the original expression is large. So in the next 10 minutes, uh, let me try to give a very high level proof overview of the random uh, restriction theorem. Uh, to recall, the theorem says that uh, if we have a Boolean function says that uh, after random restriction, uh, f is correlated to a linear function with non-negligible probability, then f is indeed correlated with a product of linear function and low degree functions and a low degree function. So we consider a typical scenario in the proof overview. So let's start with the assumption that uh, the restricted function is correlated to a linear function. So in this picture, so this is the subset i, and this is the restricted part. And after doing that, f is correlated to chi s. So I'm defining the linear function, uh, or representing the linear function by the corresponding subset s here. So the first trick that we apply is that uh, if you have a linear function and if you restrict a few other coordinates of that linear function, then the restricted function is correlated to the, to the same linear function or 
uh, the same unrestricted part of the linear function. Uh, so in other words, if you uh, if you sample some other uh, subset i prime and restrict that to z prime, then the same uh, Fourier coefficient, which is s intersection i prime complement now, uh, it is large in the new restrict newly restricted function. Now the second trick which you can show using Cauchy shorts is that you can really re-randomize the second restricted uh, assignment. So you have these sets i i prime with restrictions z z prime, and if you resample the second uh, assignment z prime in this diagram, it is z double prime, then the same Fourier coefficient stays uh, large in both these restricted functions uh, typically. So what this tells us that. Uh, the correlated linear function, it does not really depend on the restrictions z and z prime. If you look at the overall restriction as uh, as one thing, the overall restriction on i and i prime. Which means that for a typical uh, subset i and i prime, uh, there is a subset t such that uh, this uh, uh, restricted function is correlated to the, uh, uh, the character chi t. So let's say w i i prime be the set of all such uh, linear functions. Again, we are uh, we are mapping a linear functions to a subset of the coordinates. So using the above property, uh, we can also conclude that if we resample the second uh, 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 set of restrictions, which is the or the second uh, second subset, then the compatible linear function t remains in the set i w i i double i double prime. Okay, so we have this condition now that you sample i and you sample i prime and you resample i double prime, then we have a compatible linear functions in the list. Compatible in the sense that it is a linear function here. Uh, so suppose the restricted function here is uh, correlated to the linear function this, then the restricted function over here typically is correlated to the linear function t prime, which is just the same set, but uh, you remove uh, uh, this part of the restriction from this set t. So if we have this guarantee, does that mean that there is a global linear function so that f is co correlated to the chi s? And we formulate this as a direct product testing question. So the last condition that we got out of this analysis, it's really a direct product uh, testing question. So let's say k is this number, which is n minus i size of i and size of i prime, which is the number of coordinates that are left alive. And let's define a map from the set of live variables to 0, 1 to the k, where you map the set A to a linear function t, uh, which is uh, present in this set w i i prime. Okay, so in this picture, suppose for this restriction uh, where we are restricting coordinates from i and i prime, the function is correlated to, uh, typically are correlated to this set t, then we map f of a, which is the set of live variables, uh, to this subset T or a random subset uh, from this uh, set W I I I prime. Now, since these are compatible uh, using the, this property, uh, typically what happens is that uh, under this map, if you take a random set A and B, then they agree on the intersection. Okay. So again, you select uh, the way you select A and B is you select I I prime. I, I double prime and you take the complement of that. So A and A prime, they'll have some non-trivial intersection. And uh, this property tells us that uh, this direct product, this map, it satisfies certain uh, direct product test. So let me define that formally. So here we are given a table that maps every subset of N to a k-bit string. Uh, uh, so an assignment to a subset can be thought of as assigning a bit to every element in S, where you fix some ordering on S. And we want to check whether f is coming from a global string, whether there exists a, a string a such that f of any set a is just the restriction of a to that subset. So here is the natural test for uh, for the uh, for this for, to check whether this condition holds. You just pick two sets whose intersection is uh, non-trivial, and you just test whether uh, the entries of the table. Uh, and these two sets, they agree on the intersection. So direct product tests are studied uh, uh, in in many uh, papers, and uh, so the first, uh, so Goldreich and Safra they introduced uh, this test uh, to check the global property by doing some local checks. 
and they give a constant query direct for test. Uh, then because of uh, its application to PCPs, we wanted to get like uh, direct product tests with as few queries as possible. So the new RAN code, they gave two query direct product tests, but in the 99% regime where uh, they can get the conclusion where the test accepts with priority 99% or one minus epsilon. And the new RAN Goldenberg, uh, they improved this to a two query direct product test in the 1% regime. Uh, so more formally, they show that if the test passes with priority one or poly k, then there's a global string a such that for at least poly uh, one or poly k fraction of the sets s, uh, the table agrees with the global string a. There should be a here um, on uh, on a, on a, on a constant fraction of the coordinates. So this only gives you, so this, this pushes the result till uh, this factor one or poly k. And in order to improve that, in Pagliello, Cabinets, and Migdason, they gave a three query test with soundness exponentially in k. So the two query test cannot, so the soundness cannot be improved to more than, uh, less than poly k. So that's why uh, we need to move to three query test if you, if you want the soundness of uh, exponentially in k. After that, Dinur and Livni Navon, they improved this uh, result where they get the soundness uh, of truly exponential in K. So two to the uh, omega minus K instead of two to the minus K to the some constant. And recently, Dinur, Filmus and Harsha, they gave a two query test in the 99% regime uh, to get a stronger conclusion. So here, instead of like approximate matching, they gave a conclusion where there exists a global string A uh, such that for at least one minus epsilon fraction of the sets, F of S agrees with the global string A. Again, this should be A here. Okay. And uh, uh, to, to finish our uh, uh, previous proof, uh, we wanted to uh, understand so the previous proof uh, here, uh, from the from the conclusion, we constructed a map where it passes the uh, uh, direct product test with uh, non-negligible probability. And from this, we wanted to conclude that, you know, there is this global linear function S so that F is correlated to the global function S by S. And this is where we, uh, we apply our direct pro product testing results as these previous results, they were not enough. So the statement of our direct product result is this. So let Q be any constant and suppose uh, F that maps every subset of size QN to a string of length QN. So that the direct product test passes with non-negligible probability. Then there exists a global function or a global string. So that for at least uh, some poly epsilon fraction of the sets, we have that the table agrees with the global function on all, but only constantly many coordinates. So in this sense, this is a stronger conclusion. So in other words, our direct product test gives a stronger conclusion of, uh, compared to uh, the previous result of uh, Dinur, Harsha, and Filmus in the sense that uh, uh, it works in the 1% regime. So we can get the conclusion even if the test passes with priority epsilon instead of one minus epsilon. And compared to uh, Dinur and Goldenberg, uh, this agreement conclusion is stronger. Dinur and Goldenberg, they only get this agreement where uh, the global string agrees with the table on constant fraction of the coordinates where we get a much stronger conclusion and we needed that to finish our proof. Uh, so the conclusion he here is that the global string agrees with the table on all but constantly many coordinates. Okay, and, uh, once we apply that, uh, once we apply this uh, direct product theorem to our previous uh, analysis, then that gives us a global function chi s, which is correlated to our function f. And that finishes the proof. So since the title says uh, approximate of satisfiable CSP, what is the connection of uh, this project with uh, approximability? Uh, so we have a series of paper where we study approximability of satisfiable CSPs and the study of this theorem is motivated by application, its application to the CSP project. So currently uh, we can handle theory predicates. And if we want to generalize that our uh, results to higher array predicates, then we needed a certain type of this random restriction theorem. And hopefully this will be useful in extending our, uh, uh, generalizing our previous work. Okay, so with this, let me end my talk. 
Thanks for watching.